Yeah, perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we'll just go ahead and jump into it. I'll put on the pointer here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, first of all, thanks, Eve, for organizing this webinar and making it possible and giving me the opportunity to speak with the great Jeremy Barr. Um, but we already had the introduction, so maybe it's good to immediately dive in. And I wanted to start off a bit with explaining as to why we would use phage antibiotic combinations. And well, first, it's very important to keep in mind that in most parts of the world, phages are not incorporated as routine practices. They're used under the Helsinki Convention, meaning when nothing else is working or as a last resort. So a lot of the patients you're treating already have like very extensive antibiotic treatment. So it's very important to understand these inter interactions you can have between phages and antibiotics. But secondly, we also want to try and exploit the concept of evolutionary fitness costs. And to try and explain this in the clearest way possible, you can try and think of monkeys and humans. Well, monkeys have evolved to have muscles which are much longer than we as humans have. So it's making, them, making it possible for them to hang in trees for four to five hours without having any problems. Well, we as humans, we have evolved to have very more uh, shorter muscles and precise muscles, making it possible for us to throw a very precise pitch. But the other way around, it's not working. We are not able to hang four or five hours in trees. And this is what we can exploit with phage and antibiotics as well, because imagine a bacteria uh, incorporating more porine structures in its cell membrane to become resistant towards any sort of antibiotics. Well, if you then use a phage, which is adhering to the sporines, then you could use this evolutionary process to your benefit. And if we have a very effective treatment, then we would limit the resistance development against both active agents. And this would mean that we could lower the concentrations of antibiotics use. And this is generally a good thing. However, um, there are some interesting papers indicating that low antibiotic concentrations often even stimulate bacterial growth. So that's something that we really got to keep in mind as well when using lower antibiotic concentrations. And if you look a bit more into my project and to what I am doing, I'm working mostly in the orthopedic setting. And here on the left, you can see infect, infected tibia fracture and on the right, a prosthetic joint infection of the knee. And needless to say, these are very complicated infections, not only due to the fact that you have a lot of antibiotic resistance, but also due to the fact that you have biofilm formation on these orthopedic implants. And for those of you not working in the field, well, what is a biofilm? Well, a biofilm is presented here and you can see it, you can define it sort of as a micro community of different microorganisms which are living together in this self-produced matrix polymeric substance and while forming this biofilm bacterial cells will undergo a metabolic switch becoming dormant or metabolically inactive cells and this will make these cells very much less sensitive towards antibiotics when pieces of this biofilm are sloughed off and come into the circulation they can cause recurrent infections and in the, why is this so prevalent in orthopedic infections? Well, when you put in an orthopedic implant, it's important to know that bacteria can adhere almost 10,000 times better towards, these, uh, towards the implant material than compared to the native tissue. It's about 80% of all clinical infections which are having these biofilm components. So it's very important to and new treatment, um, treatments for these biofilms. So for my project, what I'm trying to do is looking to see if I can isolate some phages and test them in combinations with antibiotics to try and disrupt this biofilm structure. So for my project, when I started, the first thing I needed to be doing was isolating phages. And as I wanted to have orthopedically relevant phages and water samples or the easiest sampling sources, I thought, okay, hospital sewages would seem to be the best sampling source. So of course, at that time, it was still COVID time. So you can imagine it wasn't always easy trying to call up these hospital, hospitals, asking if I could go and get some viruses out of their sewages. But eventually you can see a list here of all the hospitals we visited multiple times. And for those of you thinking that these are the phage isolations are kind of a tropic destination, well, my intern here, which you can see on the right, um, of which I had a lot, a lot, a lot of help, always joined me for these phage isolations. And it's just really taking a bottle with you and descending into sewages. So, not only did we use 
hospital sewages, but I was always this weird guy with empty water bottles in his car. And every time I passed a pond or a lake or a park, I tried to collect some environmental samples as well. Um, additionally, as I'm working with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphyreus, for Staphyreus and Epidermidus, as some of you may know, it's way more difficult to find bacteriophages. Um, you have to be a bit inventive with the sampling sources that you can use. You need to try and find sampling sources where you would find your host bacteria as well. And as Staphylococcus is, is often found in, oh, I have to see my first, ah, here it is. Uh, it's often found in the nose of people. I managed to get my hands on some nasal, nasal and skin swaps, which were used uh, for MRSA testings. And I also used a nasal washing device. And you can see my brother-in-law here because I asked my entire family to wash the nose so I could recuperate the water afterwards. Um, but we also managed to, to sample some human breast milk samples and some wound compresses coming from infected patients. And interestingly, in the human breast milk samples and the wound compresses, we isolated bacteriophages. And this entire process resulted in a collection of about 80 phage clones active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and about 10 phage clones active against Staphyreus and Staph epidermis. So these were all produced in high titers to give, to give them long-term stability. And the next thing I needed to do once I had my phages was go and test them on biofilms. So what I started doing off was I grew uh, PA Pseudomonas aeruginosa PA1 biofilms in 96 well plates. And after 24 hours, I obtained a mature biofilm. And once I had these mature biofilms, I added different combination of phages and antibiotics to look at biomass, CFUs, and metabolic assays. And when we look at the results, very interestingly, as I already said before, um, biofilms are known to be very much uh, less sensitive towards antibiotics. So I wanted to perform some essays and I want to show you the ones that I did with only one time the MIC of antibiotics, where we can see in black always a positive control. Um, the white with the bars is always the antibiotic and every color represents a phage with the purple being the phage cocktail. Every time the color with the bars is always the phage antibiotic combination. And what we see here is that when we use monotherapies of phages or antibiotics, we're only slightly reducing our biofilm. However, when we use phage antibiotic combinations, most efficient biofilm disruption and destruction is seen for both biomass as for CFUs. And this wasn't only the case with cyprofloxacin, but we also tested it with miropenem. And again, here, this is what I told you guys about lower antibiotic concentrations, which could even stimulate biofilm growth or bacterial growth. While when adding a combined phage antibiotic treatment, we were able to see reductions in biomass or uh, countable, countable cells. And with ceftazidine, again, we had similar characteristics. With the phage cocktail in combination with ceftazidine was proven to be the most effective, but in general, phage antibiotic concentrations were most effective. And so we didn't only want to use biomass and see a few assays, but we also wanted to see what was really going on with the viable cells in our biofilm. So these results represent met in metabolic assay where I grew first biofilms. And then when I added my treatment, I added the long A dye, which is converted by viable cells. And it's the converted dye that we will transform in a signal and in graphs, as you can see here. And interestingly, again, what you can see here, this time we increased the antibiotic concentrations a bit, is that the combined treatment represented in blue with either ciprofloxacin, miropenem, or ceftazidine was seen to be, again, the most effective in reducing biofilm respiratory rate or metabolism in this case. And we also wanted to know like what's really going on with the biofilm in the orthopedic setting on, orto uh, on the biofilm itself. So what we did was we grew some um, PA1 biofilms on titanium coupons representing or mimicking the implant material. And here on the left, you can see a untreated PA1 biofilm, and this is what it looks like under a microscope. And if we add either phages or phages in combination with antibiotics, you can see the clear reductions of PA1 cells were obtained on these titanium coupons. And if we look into or zoom it into a bit more in detail, this is what it looks like. Like here on the left, you can see an untreated PA1 biofilm, while on the right, you have a biofilm treated with phages, and a lot of these pseudomonas are cells or eliminated from the titanium coupon. But 
most interesting results were obtained when we wanted to look what would be the most effective form of treatment, a combined treatment, or would it be a sequential treatment? Because literature indicates that when you use first phages to maybe cut open a bit your biofilm and then reactivate these bacterial cells to regain the target for antibiotics, that would seem to be the most effective. So what we did is we 48 out treatments where we added first a phage, then an antibiotic, or vice versa or 48 hours the combined treatment. And what we saw was very interesting. When we did sequential treatments, we did have significantly de uh, vast decreases in biomass and artitanium response, but in between these biofilm islands, let's say, you could still find a lot of PAO1 cells in the gate with these red arrows. However, when we use a simultaneous treatment or combined treatment for 48 hours, this was no longer the case. And when you, in, when you zoom in even further, this becomes even more clear because here you can see on the left, a lot of P1 cells still residing on titanium coupons. While when we did a 48 hour simultaneous treatment, this was no longer the case. And so this wraps up a bit the results I had with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I'm also working with Stavrius. So after these results, I was very, uh, very optimistic and dove into the next experiments and phage antibiotic synergy assays on Stavarius and Epidermidis as well. But then first results were quite demotivating because every time I used phage antibiotic combinations for Stavarius biofilms, I didn't have good results. And then I tried everything. I tried doing those metabolic assays again. But again, here you can see only the phage is having a slight effect on my biofilms. But phage antibiotic combinations did not. So we could observe some slight decreases, but there were no overwhelming biofilm destructions to be observed. So that started to get me thinking a bit on what I was doing for my project. Oh, and the, ah, the slide is moving in. So then I started thinking, well, what I'm doing for my project is I'm making a multi-species biofilm model. And I'm using a, I'm incorporating a Candida albicans, which I'm first growing for 24 hours, and then I'm adding a Stavarius and Pseudomonas aeruginosa to the mix. However, if you're working with multi-species models, you have to know that sometimes, and especially in this case with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Stavarius, is that the Pseudomonas aeruginosa tends to overgrow and even push out the Stavarius from the biofilms. So then at first I had a very useful tip from the Azuredo lab in Portugal saying that if you add serum to the media, you can balance out these um, inhibitory effects of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And that's what we saw here. We managed to get a uh, stable three species biofilm up until 72 hours when we added serum to the media. But although I still had bad results with Stavarius biofilms, I thought something must be up here. And then at VAM in Portugal this summer, I came across a poster saying that serum might be the cause effect is somehow in it inhibiting the effect of my phages. So straight when coming back, I thought, okay, let's give this a try and do exactly the same as if you would and see if you, when you remove the serum, something happens. And these are the results I obtained when I added serum to the media. But look what happens when the serum in my media was just removed and everything else was the same. It was just a 10% serum that I removed from the media. All of a sudden, my phage is almost entirely disrupting my biofilm in my 96 soil plates. So this was very interesting. And then I started repeating this on a larger scale and this was repeatable as well. So every time I removed the serum, my phages became somehow more potent. And so I was very interested in this phage and we had it sequenced. And then at first it was a bit difficult to try and record, try and know what information I could get out of this FASTA files, but I had a lot of help from Jeroen Wagemans and the team of Rob Levine, as well as the team in Portugal, and they managed to help me find a depolymerase in this phage genome. So what I did was I used a depolymerase prediction tool and I added the sequence of my phage and I found a very nice hit. So then I was looking more into detail what depolymerases were and I came across this paper from um, the team in Portugal. Oh, ah, here it is. Um, and I saw the name of Yugi Oliveira. So I contacted him and he said, okay, a depolymerase must be something from the tail of your phage and it has to have a pectide lias domain. And he sent me to a database where I could go and look for it. And indeed we identified the pectide lias domain. 
And I was thinking, oh, but it's still pre-neck appendage protein. Maybe I should do a bit more research about this. And interestingly, I the first paper I found was by Diana Gutierrez and our host of the day, Eve Breers. Um, and this was a very funny coincidence to sort of end a bit my presentation as I was also trying to see if we could do some phage immobilization uh, assays or protein immobilization assays on orthopedic implants. So I contacted Eve this week, not only for the presentation, but also to see if we could maybe um, produce these depolymerase and see what we can do with it on um, our biofilm models. So to wrap up a bit my presentation, um, during my project, I've been isolating a large collection of bacteriophages. And when I tested them on biofilms, these phage antibiotic assays clearly showed highest biofilm removal. Um, interestingly, when we did a combined treatment, it was seen to be most if more efficient than any sequential monotherapy we tested. And then um, last but not least, serum supplementation somehow is inhibiting the effects of the phages on staphylococcal biofilms. And this really needs further elucidating, especially with clinical application of these phages in mind. And I'm happy to wrap up and say that after two weeks of spending on FASTA files and bioinformatics tools um, that we managed to identify an interesting deep polymerase. So with this, I've came to the end of my part. And I think Jeremy, if you are ready, can take control of the presentation again. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, so all attendees can put their questions in the chat box. We will deal with them afterwards. And uh, if Jeremy now can take over the screen, we continue with the second part of the webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Eves. Uh, really honored to be here. Like honored for the invitation. So thank you. And um, to Stephen, like great talk. It was really exciting to see results and data. Um, and very humbled and honored to yeah, be speaking here today. So, so thank you both. So Stephen, I think you have to stop sharing. Yeah. And then Jeremy can take over. Okay, I'll stop sharing only. I think we're still seeing your screen. Okay, I might be able to stop share. There we go. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me get set up. All right, can people see my slides okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. It's a um, real pleasure to be here. Um, very honored for the invitation. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Eves. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming along. And I, I really liked, Eve, your introduction to the session, sort of normalizing science and talking about how difficult it is to do research. And I, and I want to maybe preface that and say with this talk, you know, I'm going to present about 20 minutes of research, but would sort of emphasize this has been about three and a half years of work. Um, it's still ongoing. It's still not published. It's it's never smooth sailing. There's always things that that go wrong, and um, there's a lot of challenges and resiliences in in pursuing science. So what I'm going to tell you today is about uh, an Enterobacter phage cocktail that we've been building to sort of combat nosocomial infections. And I'm going to jump right into the deep end and talk about uh, nosocomial infections. So these are hospital acquired infections, typically patients who are already in hospital, already sick. Uh, they're immunocompromised, they're typically on antibiotics, immunosuppressive suppressive drugs, they may have complex wounds or other uh, pathologies. And it's in this situation that they unfortunately can pick up uh, bacterial infections that are residing in the hospital. These can be um, natural carriage in uh, plumbing, piping, surfaces, sometimes carried by the hospital staff. And these infections can be very virulent and they can also have a lot of antimicrobial resistance determinants. They're very, very nasty infections. We've also got up here Anton Pellick. So Anton is a, a big collaborator of ours. Anton is the head of infectious diseases at the Alfred, which is one of the biggest um, hospitals in Melbourne. And it treats a lot of very complex infectious disease cases. And so what Anton and his um, team at the Alfred have done is they've sort of documented and outlined an ongoing outbreak of nosocomial infections caused by these Enterobacteriaceae, this big family of gram-negative um, pathogens with, with many of the common names that I'm sure you will recognize. 
So these are hospital acquired infections. They're typically highly drug resistant and highly virulent. This is a little snapshot of the number of uh, nosocomial AMR infections that have been isolated from bloodstream infections from patients from the Alfred over the last sort of 10 to 15 years roughly seeing about 20 infections per year, but you'll notice, particularly over the last three to four years, how much this has spiked. And this has all been driven by an outbreak of these carbapenemase uh, producing plasmids that are highly mobile and transferred and are causing big problems in the hospitals. These infections typically have high mortality rates, upwards of 20%. Uh, they're driven by AMR and there's very limited treatment options available for these infections. Now, the Alfred and Anton and his team have been documenting these infections for over 15 years now. These isolates are stored, they're cultured, they're typically whole genome sequenced. And so we have a really good database of all of these isolates. And I want to particularly emphasize this big green cluster that's really become prominent over the last three to four years. And these are caused by Enterobacter cloaceae complex. It's a group of seven bacterial species that we group together in this complex, and I'm simply just going to refer to them as ECC for short. And at the time we started this study, Anton and team had over 150 clinical isolates that had been found from the Alfred that all resulted from bloodstream infections. So we had this great starting sample set to begin to build and try and build a phage treatment for this ongoing problem. So um, this is sort of a, a promo slide for Dinesh. He's a postdoc in our groups and with us for about three to four years, and he's really led all of this work. And this has been his major project in our lab is designing and developing this phage cocktail, and sort of redefining how we you can use biology and construct these cocktails to met this un to met this unmet clinical need. And so we had a few design principles that we wanted to implement when using a cocktail. I think the term cocktail is very overused, and I realize that I'm propagating that right now. Uh, but there's not a lot of real principles. And so we wanted to set how are we going to design and develop this cocktail? So I said we had about 150 isolates that we could begin with. We decided that that was too many. We felt too many to start with. So instead, we chose a subsection of 37 isolates. These were representative of the most pathogenic and uh, prominent ST types or sequence types. But we also took a very diverse collection of sequence types. And these are shown in these colored bars here. So we've got our three most prominent sequence types causing infection at the top, but a large diversity of other genetically distinct clades uh, in this ECC population. We also only selected phages with high lytic activity. So anything that didn't propagate well, formed small inconsistent plaques, we didn't bother take for, taking forward. And we made the decision that each phage in our cocktail had to target a unique receptor on the bacterial host surface. And the reason for this is that uh, we felt that that would increase our host range and would also limit the cross resistance uh, or the cross emergence of phage resistance for each phage in the cocktail. We also wanted to work with the minimum number of phages with the broadest host range coverage to limit the size of our cocktails. Every phage that we add increases the sort of production and complexity. And I'll, and I'll touch on that at the end of the talk. So these are our, uh, this is our initial three phage cocktail. So ENCO7, 15, and ENAO2. We've got a lot of information about these phages. We've got some beautiful TEM pictures. We've got whole genome information. These are closed genomes that we've annotated and we can pull out a lot of biology from these. We've got one step growth curve so we can determine the birth size, latent period and other uh, fundamental characteristics of the phage. And we've also got some very long-term stability data. So here we've stored these three phages at 37 degrees, at four degrees in room temp. And you can see 37 degrees, fairly rapid degradation over maybe a three to four month period. But room temp and four degrees, these phages are extremely stable. We've got out to 18 months now, and we see no drop at four degrees. So that's that's uh, a big plus, particularly when we're thinking about producing and storing and transporting this cocktail. So also mentioned that we wanted to target different receptors. And this is something that I, I really passionately believe in when we're characterizing phages, is trying to identify the phage receptor, because it tells us so much information about how the phage behaves and how we can utilize this phage. And so to do this really simply, we grow the phage and the host in a growth curve shown in this black line here. And I'm sure many of you have seen this very quickly in lab conditions, you see the emergence of phage resistant mutants. These are mutant phages that have typically loss of function mutations in the receptor genes. And by isolating these phages and sequencing them, we can find loss of function mutations or SNPs or gene deletions in key genes, which gives us a hint that that might be the receptor. 
And so this is a, a little bit of a complex schematic of the gram negative cell wall with our inner membrane, peptidoglycan layer, outer membrane, and LPS units. Our first phage, we found a loss of function mutation in a glycosyl transferase gene that was associated with uh, attaching glycan residues to the inner core in the LPS structure. Our next phage, we found a loss of function in this UTP transferase. It's quite a broad glycosyl transferase that's associated with adding different sugars onto biological components. It is associated with the peptidoglycan, but it's also associated with the uh, outer, outer chain of the, or the outer or antigen of the LPS. So it's potentially modulating and changing two different aspects of the bacterial cell surface. And our third phage, we actually found two cognate receptors. The first was in the O antigen, and the second was actually an outer membrane protein, this OMPW, which is associated with iron uptake and import. And this plays an important role in virulence with this bacterial host. So each of the phages targeting a different receptor or a different aspect, at least of this LPS outer core. And then in addition to this, um, we complement the wild type gene back in on all of these loss of function mutations and thereby and confirm phage infectivity. And this is a short and easy way to sort of confirm that that gene was the phage receptor for these. We also looked at the efficiency of plating or EOP. Um, and so while these three phages could plaque and infect across the vast majority of these isolates, they didn't do so very well in all of them. So an EOP of one showing that this phage has um, quite high infectivity on the given host. But you can see that there's a couple of phages down here that have an EOP around 1% compared to uh, an additional host. And so while this phage may be able to infect a given uh, strain, it doesn't do so very well. So it wasn't very well adapted. And I'm going to come back and touch on this EOP in a few slides time. So we wanted to start to build a sort of in vitro and in vivo model to sort of test the effect of this cocktail. So we chose our three phages and we found a single host in our collection, uh, this AP507 strain, that all three phages could infect at an EOP of one. And we thought this was a good uh, single strain that we could begin to do some in vitro and in vivo models. So here we're looking at growth curve. So in orange, we've got the host on its own over about a 48 hour period. In uh, purple, red, and blue, we've got each of the three phages on their own. And in black, we've got the phage cocktail in combination. You'll notice that all three phages, we see an initial drop in lytic activity. Uh, in ENC 15 and 07, we see the emergence of phage resistant, which is not uncommon in lab conditions. But ENA 02, we didn't see phage resistant emerge, at least in lab conditions. And of course, the cocktail together, we had the greatest antimicrobial inhibition, no emergence of the resistance which was probably driven by ENA02, but undoubtedly also contributed by the other two phages in the cocktail. And so we took this in vitro model and we started to translate this into an in vivo model. Uh, our lab set up this bacteremia model. It's quite an acute infection. So typically 12 to 16 hours. Here we IP inoculate five mice per group with the host. And then one hour later, we give the phage cocktail at an MOI of one. Uh, 12 hours later, we um, euthanize the mice, and then we collect blood, liver, spleen, and kidney, and we perform CFU and PFU counts on all of these organs. And this is what we, we find here. So this is looking at bacterial load, and you can see the average in the control. We had very high bacterial load, upwards of 10 to the 9 grams, uh, sorry, colonies per gram of tissue. These mice were very, very sick and hit their humane endpoint. And our phage treated groups, we saw four to six log reduction in bacterial colonization. So really, really strong antimicrobial effect in vivo. And this is broken down in organs. You can see we almost had complete eradication of the bacteria in blood. We do have some bacterial persisters in the organs, but these would likely be naturally cleared in these, in these mice. Interestingly, with our phages, we saw all three phages propagating in the host. We didn't see a significant difference between any of the phages. There was a slight preference not significantly different for ENA02, which is our phage that didn't show the emergence of resistance, but all three phages were replicating in all uh, organs and locations of the animal. And so at this point, we felt we had a pretty good phage cocktail, three phages built on this 37 isolate collection. And we felt now's the time, let's go back to the alpha, let's go back and test it against their whole entire clinical collection. And so this is what we did, uh, and this is a spot test assay across that clinical library. It's a bit messy, but really I want you to just focus on this one row. This is the activity of the cocktail. Red shows complete lysis. The sort of orange yellow is partial lysis and blue being no lysis. And our cocktail performed okay. We had about 65% coverage against the library, not as high as we would have liked, 
Uh, and you can see that there's a number of problematic STs that we didn't have very good coverage against. We had low coverage and low activity for that three-phage cocktail. So we went back to the lab. We wanted to do better. We felt 65% wasn't good enough to move this into the hospital. And so we did two approaches. The first approach is the obvious one is using targeted isolation. So we chose those problematic STs that we didn't have good coverage against. We fished in sewage, just like Stephen, Stephen did in his talk before, and we isolated a few novel phages. We found two phages here, Taquito and Pocky, uh, that had good coverage against our low coverage STs. And they also were very broad host range phages. They have strong lytic activity and these are great candidates and we've characterized these. We have receptors for them and a lot of information and including them in a five phage cocktail. But we also wanted to improve our original three phage cocktail. And so we used a phage training, a phage evolution approach to see if we could increase the effectiveness of this phage cocktail. Now there's a lot of um, emerging literature on phage training, um, the genetics and evolution of these phages. And there's a lot of different approaches and subtle changes in the method can really influence and impact your outcomes in your training approach. And so what we wanted to do is we felt that we had a good initial three phages, but we knew that there was this problem where a number of the phages had a very low EOP. They infected a host, but not very well. And so what we aim to do is to evolve our phages on those low EOP hosts to see if we could increase their infectivity. So we're not trying to increase host range. We're really trying to boost the infectivity of those phages against those low EOP hosts. Um, this work was done by Riley, who is an honors student in our, in our lab, and she did a relatively simple phage training experiment. We did this in multiplex, 96 well plates. We had the host, we had the ancestral phage, and these were incubated overnight, 37 degrees and shaking. The next day, we add chloroform to clear up and remove the bacteria. And so we're just left with our phage population. We centrifuge this, and then we isolate and collect the evolved phage. And that's a population of phage. We then take that population of phage and put it back onto the ancestral host, and we repeat this. And we repeat this for 10 days, many different populations, many different phage combination host pairs. And I want to take a segue here and, and touch on a really at least what I think is an important point when we're talking about phage training and experimental evolution. And that is that when we're training a phage and we do this iterative uh, evolution, we're evolving a population. We have many, many different phage genotypes that are leading to different benefits and increase in host fitness. But for phage therapy, at least looking at the regulatory landscape at the moment, we need to have a defined phage product and a phage cocktail in order to treat a patient. We can't simply dose a patient with hundreds and thousands of different evolved phage populations. We might be able to, but um, I don't think that's the best approach. And so what we did is we, after we evolved the phages, we went back and we picked single plaques. They were double plaque purified, and then we are screening these. So we are actually screening a single genotype that was selected from a population of evolved phages. And I do think that's an important distinction when we're talking about phage training and evolution. I'm just going to show you, show you one of our evolved phages in this talk. So this is our evolved ENC07 phage. Uh, and this is what I'm going to show you is comparisons between the ancestor, the non-evolved, or the wild type compared to the evolved phage. And this is on one of the one of these hosts, AH17. And here you can see that the evolved or the ancestor phage was already plating at a relatively high EOP. And we saw not really much of an increase. We didn't really see much of an increase for the evolved phage. But importantly, this phage was already well adapted to that host. And when we looked at how this phage beh behaved on low EOP hosts, we actually saw between a one to two log increase in e EOP or the effectiveness of that phage. So that phage was able to increase its effectiveness on low EOP hosts but we didn't see really much of an increase on these high fitness hosts. We weren't improving the high fitness um, lytic capacity any further. We screen this across all our library. I don't you ex expect you to take in this here, but um, this is really just to make the point that we didn't see any decreases in EOP. So these evolved phages, we only saw an increase. We didn't see any statistically significant decrease in EOP across that library with that evolved phage. That's not to say it doesn't happen. At least in our screening, we didn't see any evidence of that. And because we have a single phage genotype, we can go in and we can characterize that given phage genetically and uh, phenotypically. And so what I'm showing you here is a one-step growth curve, a single phage replicative cycle. And we're looking at the ancestor in blue and the evolved phage in pink. Uh, and we saw no change in the latent period. We saw no change in the birth size, but we saw this huge increase in phage absorption. 
So we saw more phages able to infect and bind or absorb to a phage over a single step uh, compared to that ancestor. We're also able to sequence these phages, and we found a number of uh, SNPs and mutations in the tail fiber genes. And using AlphaFold, we can predict the locations, uh, and we found these mutations falling in the tail fiber domains, again, fitting with this adaptation leading to that increased absorption of that evolved phage. Now, as a side effect, we also saw that these evolved phages had an expanded host range. We didn't train our phages for this, but we saw this as an additional step. Um, so ENC07, we didn't see too big of an increase in the host range, but for two of our other phages that we evolved, we did see a slight increase. And when combining this in the cocktail, we got about an extra 10% in host coverage for host range, even though we didn't specifically evolve those phages to broaden their host range in this approach. And so summary of this little section, we saw an increased infectivity of the low EOP hosts. It was driven by an increase in absorption. And we also saw as a side effect, an increase in phage host range. And so at this point, we felt that we had a good cocktail and we wanted to go back to the hospital. So we took our three evolved phages plus our two new phages that we isolated. And we went back and we screened. And this collection had grown over this number of years. So I think it was up to about 170 ECC clinical isolates. And we tested a range of different phage cocktails. Don't expect you to take this in. This was all um, double blinded. So we had eight different cocktails that really consisted of different combinations of the original and the evolved plus our two new phages. Um, red showing complete lysis, yellow showing partial lysis, and blue being no lysis. Um, I'm really just going to focus on cocktail seven and eight. Uh, scoring was double blinded. So we, the uh, person who made the cocktails and then three people who scored them didn't know which cocktail was which. Um, and the scores are qualitative. So we gave the phage a two for complete lysis, a one for hazy, and a zero for no lysis. And based on that score, we came up with this qualitative percentage prediction. And so what we found was that cocktail eight had an 87% score, meaning that it hit all of our isolates in the clinical collection uh, with either complete or partial lysis. And that gave a score of 87. So if every phage had complete lysis, the score would be 100%. Um, both importantly, both cocktail seven and eight, which were our five phage cocktail, had 100% host coverage across that library if we're factoring in partial lysis. And we see this weird phenomenon where the evolved phage is worse, right? It's 87% versus 85% to the evolved to the original plus the two new phages. So was it worse? I, I don't believe it was. And I'll give two reasons for it. This is a qualitative assay. So this is just a spot assay. Can it infect yes or no? And I think we're seeing a very slight difference. I wouldn't say that's statistically significant. And I'll also come back to the point of how we train the phages. We train the phages to increase their EOP and not broaden their host range. So while this suggests that the host range of the spot assay didn't increase for the evolved phage, We've got strong evidence that these evolved phage are much better and have a stronger lytic activity than the original phages. So we're now going ahead and producing this. The goal is to produce this as a frontline therapeutic. This cocktail has activity against all of the Alfred clinical isolates for ECC isolated to date. We've also screened so far three clinical isolates, one from the UK, one from Queensland in Australia, and one from a different hospital in Melbourne. And our phage cocktail could infect all of those three isolates, which is great signs. And so we're in the process of producing this, and this is in collaboration with the Phage Australia, which is a big national uh, aggregate of phage researchers and clinicians trying to professionalize and move phage therapy into the hospital. And so for the last minute or two, I'm kind of over time, so I'll go pretty quickly, but I want to run through how we're producing these phages. And so we're using these single bag production systems. These are sealed end-to-end -end single use bags that we're able to inoculate media. We can add in our host, it's oxygen and temperature controlled. And so we can maximize the growth and the lytic production of phages. And we can produce uh, these in between one to three liter volumes. We then run through a sequential depth filtration followed by a sterilizing grade filtration. So what you're seeing here is um, this product's already gone through depth filtration to remove the bacterial host. We then go through dual stage sterilizing filtration into a sealed um, bottle. Uh, and here we have our raw sterilized phage product. This is then moved into a separate sort of clean room facility where we go through a um, dilution, a washing event. So we dilute that product about tenfold in a buffer. And then we concentrate it using this machine here, which is a pump with a TFF filter. And we can concentrate that product down to about 100 to 200 mils. And you can see that's clean. We've removed all the bacterial media and we've got a concentrated wash product. 
We then go through an endotoxin removal step if required. And then finally, we package these into single use vials in syringe accessible format. And these are passed off to the Alfred um, to treat patients. We're right now in the process treating our first patient from a phage that we've isolated, produced, and treated all here in, in Melbourne, Australia. So I'll wrap up, give a big thanks to my lab. Photos a little bit out of date now, um, particularly to Dinesh, but also Fernando, Rosine, Riley, and Issa. Uh, big shout out and thanks to Anton Peleg, his lab, the Alfred Hospital, our funders. And for the last sort of 30 seconds, a minute, I want to give a plug for Viruses and Microbes 2024. I think it's amazing you have a Belgian Society VOM events happening. Uh, and we would love to see you at VOM24 in beautiful Cairns in Australia. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cairns is situated all the way up here in northeastern, uh, sorry, northeastern Queensland. It sits right on the, on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef, right next to the Daintree Rainforest. It's going to be a great meeting. Don't want to give too much away, but we are hoping that we're going to have opportunities for um, conference attendees to feed a kangaroo and maybe pet and get a photo with a koala. But um, stay tuned. I hope to see you all there. Um, thanks for listening, and I'll pass back over to Eves. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeremy. It looks uh, exciting, uh, the, the form in 2024. And also thank you very much for this interesting talk. Thank you for highlighting at the beginning that this also took three and a half years uh, and that it was condensed in the 20-minute talk. Um, in the meantime, we got some interesting questions in the chat box. Um, let's go again to the chat box. Uh, a first question for you, um, Steven, was coming from uh, Dimitri Bukarts, and he asked you how, which prediction tool you use for the predicting the, the, the deep pollen race. Yeah, I saw a question coming in, and then I had like, some troubles like trying to find how I could really identify it. But then I went to Galaxy, and you have a phage DPO tool, and that's a tool which gives you a prediction of possible depolymerase in the genome. And then I use that to go really more in depth search with the protein sequence itself and used HHPRET with a PFAM database. And that is the one giving you the peptide lyase domains and showing you really if it would be a depolymerase. So that, those are the ones that I've been using. Another interesting question came from uh, Alvin Han. Uh, he was wondering if you filtered <clears throat> or heated the, the serum that you used. Because you know that there are a few reports that people have found that the crass phage is contaminating uh, the serum. And he was wondering if that would have caused maybe a weird competition or interaction with your phage. That, that, that could be a possible explanation. I only did it once with heat inactivated serum, and that showed similar results. That's what I had today. And I also redid those phage antibiotic synergy acid on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but then leaving the serum out. And for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, there was not a big difference. There were no statistically different effects being observed. So I think it could possibly be a kind of protective layer, which is formed by the serum around your staphylococci, making age maybe not as easy as it would be without the serum. So it has to be investigated further, but I haven't got the time to do everything already in detail. But very interesting. Good that you got this feedback. Um, another question from Akana. Uh, what could be the possible reason, Stephen, for simultaneous phage and antibiotic treatment to be more effective than the sequential treatment? I, in my opinion, I think if you're using the combined treatment, then you're putting higher pressure on these bacteria. And then you're, that evolutionary fitness costs that we discussed a bit in the beginning, I think that's what you're avoiding then because those bacteria will try and become resistant towards both your antibiotics and your phage. And this pressure can be so high that the effects are better when you use them together instead of when you use a sequential model where you give the bacteria time to first become or form resistant mutants towards a phage or an antibiotic. And then another step, and I think if you do this sequentially, then this becomes more difficult than when you put on a high evolutionary pressure, let's say. Yeah, let's move to the next question from uh, Um uh, It's related to the antibiotic phage synergy. Uh, the question is, besides meropenem and ciprofloxacin, are you testing the synergy between different classes of antibiotics and phages? 
And do you think the synergy could vary, vary according to the, the antibiotic types and classes? No, that's a very good question because I am testing a whole wide range, a variety of antibiotics, um, depending on the bacterial species that I'm using. But what I saw as well was that when I'm using, for example, protein inhibitor uh, um, antibiotics, these synergies were no longer observed. And this could be explained in a logical way because your phage needs the protein factory of your bacteria to reproduce itself. And if you're going to get rid of this with your antibiotic, then your phage will no longer have the machinery to reproduce itself. So you're not only going to have synergies between phages and antibiotics, you also have this synergies. And that's why it's important to do it with a whole wide variety of antibiotics in different classes to try and understand what's going on in the clinic, because this could explain why phage therapy is often or sometimes not working or working better than expected. So it has to be done with a whole wide variety of antibiotics, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. There's still a lot of work to do there to, to, yeah. to map this parametric. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another question came from Peter Ancesis for you, Steven, um, and it also links maybe a bit to what Jeremy was telling us. Uh, what are the clinical Im implications of serum inhibition of phages? Which was an, yeah. maybe an unexpected finding. Yeah, it was a bit unexpected. But then if you go think about clinical application, the, what you want to do is get your phage to the site of infection. And if you'll be doing I, IV infusions of your phage, well, there is serum there. So somehow this could cause any interactions. And this could explain maybe why we had it sometimes already in the lab that you were testing your phages in solutions for phagograms to see if you had potential therapeutics for a patient, that they seem to be working perfectly in the lab, but while you, had it, you give them to a patient, the infection was not that much limited or reduced. So this could explain maybe a bit why this was happening. But again, I think a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns again, still on why this inhibition is happening and what's really causing it. So I think once we'll understand this a bit more, it will be easier to know what's really going on in the clinic with patients as well. No. Yeah, that, that brings me to the questions for Jeremy, uh, maybe regarding this serum inhibition. During your talk, I was wondering whether it is uh, the training you did in vitro, if it would give another result when you do it in vivo or in the serum condition. Yeah, it's a great question. And we've thought about this in the lab. And I, I don't know the answer. We haven't done it. We've thought about ideas. Could we do this experimental evolution in vivo? And would we select for um, better phage phenotypes? Um, I don't know. I have, I have no idea what the outcome. I think it would be a very interesting experiment to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question is coming for you from uh, Peter Anstas. And he asks, is it a coincidence that all three phages are approximately the same mm -hmm. genome size, size? And are they just from the same type, but having totally different receptors? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I should know the answer to this, and I don't think that I do off the top of my head. I'd probably have to go to Dinesh, who's done all of the comparative genomics. Um, they are distinct phages. They all are myoviridae, so they do share sort of a T4-like um, genome architecture and structure. Uh, from my memory, they are distinct. I wouldn't be able to tell you the exact um, A and I or homology score between those phages, but um, it's something we should look at a bit closer. No. Uh, a question coming from uh, Dimitri Bukarts. So he asks you, why is EOP an important thing to look at as it is relative anyway and phage host pairs co evolve over time? Right. Um, so EOP is a really useful measure, and I think it's especially important in this context where we're building a phage cocktail. So we're working with three to five phages, um, and the goal here is to produce these at the highest concentration as we can, but we don't necessarily know what host those phages are going to infect. Um, so we do look at absolute titer, and we try to produce that at the highest concentration that we can, but Again, that is going to be relative depending on the host that we, we use that phage to infect. So if we're infecting a host and that phage can only affect it at a 0.1% EOP, then we've got a much lower effective titer than our absolute number. So I think it's, it's a very important measure when you're comparing a phage across multiple different host strains. 
Next question comes from Jelle Matansen. She asked you uh, about the stability and you showed data on the phase stability of 37 and 4 degrees. And he's asking you about your experience when storing them at minus 20 or at minus 80 degrees. Yeah, I, I don't have um, long-term stability data at minus 20 and minus 80. We've started storing our phages in multiple locations now because we had a fridge with all our phages that lost its temperature and that was a disaster. Um, so now we've got multiple backups and we've started storing in minus 20 and minus 80. We've done both glycerol stock. We do see a um, large reduction upon freezing. You'll break open your capsids, um, but they are fairly stable, although we haven't really assayed them too closely. Um, we are doing some infections. So now we'll infect the host and we'll just sort of freeze that host in glycerol. And that seems to be another good way to sort of do the long-term storage. So I think high term, high frequency, we're still at four degrees in, in high salt buffers. But if we want to keep something for a number of years, um, I think minus 20, minus 80 is a good, good idea, but you will lose tighter um, on that initial freeze. Yeah. Uh the next question is coming from Kopinat. Uh, he or she asked, uh, given the evolved phage can attach to the bacteria better, do you think it would outcompete the parental phage presence in, uh, present in the cocktail as well? Interesting question. Uh, I don't know if it would completely outcompete because I think you would get into all sorts of ecological dynamics and fluxes and as one phage you know, crashes that strain. Um, if the other phage is able to infect you, you know, you may see emergence of resistance and then the other phage will come in. So I don't think it will completely outcompete. Um, but I think there's some really interesting ecological dynamics that would happen there. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. There are a few more interesting questions um, in the chat box, but I propose we, we deal with them uh in the chat box as well um uh, and i would like to save the last minute to chat a bit about uh this, this webinar format uh, i think jeremy it must be have been very flattening when you got this email from stephen if uh, identified as a hero uh but i guess as a junior researcher you likely also had your heroes absolutely yep um you know i've had many heroes throughout my careers and many many mentors i think i've been really fortunate to have uh, work with some great scientists, some great phage biologists, and I was even more fortunate that most of my heroes, I think I had a chance to work with. Um, you know, Forrest, Forrest Rowe was my postdoc supervisor, and he's he's one of my biggest heroes. He's, you know, such an amazing thinker. He really challenged me and, and was a great mentor. And um, working under him for five years was 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 amazing. Um, maybe, maybe another hero for me was Rai Young who um, ran the Texas A&M group. And I remember during my postdoc, uh, Rai actually came over to our lab in San Diego and he did about a three to four month sabbatical with us and sort of sat in the office just across the hallway. And just having that opportunity to, you know, informally bump into him, have a coffee, have those sort of hallway chats. And I was still in, in awe about, you know, how much knowledge he had uh, of the phage field. And I think I learned a lot from Rai and he was someone that I, uh, really looked up to and uh, yeah, wanted to emulate in a lot of little ways that he approached science and just his personality as well. So they're, they're sort of two of my heroes. Yeah, it's always great to have much uh, contact with them. Uh, if you, you are now a senior researcher, but once you were a junior and I guess you also faced a lot of trouble, uh, trouble with experiments that they're not all successful, not at all. Uh, can you share your some advice or experience or an anecdote with the junior scientists listening today? Absolutely. Um, I could share a lot. Um, one, of, one of my PhD students, all PhD students, Marion is in the audience. And I think and she'll be able to tell you, you know, one of the things I always say in the lab is, is nothing works ever, right? Everything fails, everything goes wrong. First time you do an experiment, it's, it's not gonna work. And if it does, you've probably not analyzed it properly. And so I think so much of science is, you know, resilience and creativity. And, and I'd say, um, you know, first point being resilience, 90% of what we do is, is failing. Um, and that can be really hard, right? Whether that's experiments failing, whether that's papers being rejected, um, grants being rejected when you start to get into that. And, and so much of science is, is that failing. But I think it's important to build that resilience. And it's how do you overcome that failure? How do you push through? How do you think about your network, use the people around you, use those ideas around you. And I think that comes to the, the creativity point. And 
I think science is one of the most creative careers you can do because it's it's constant troubleshooting, it's problem solving, it's taking that time to think about why something's not working and how can you how can you get it to work. Um, and maybe one short little anecdote from my career to emphasize this. Um, started my PhD, I ran these big big reactors looking at um, bacterial communities in wastewater, and I took over a reactor that a student had been running for three years, and within a month of me taking it over, it died. It completely crashed. It failed you know, worst PhD student ever. Um, and we studied it, we kept looking and we found that it was a phage. We found TMs of a phage, we found proteomics of a phage and I kept those samples and we put them back in a new reactor and we studied and we showed that a phage got in and crashed the reactor. And that's how I fell into phage. I got into phage from being a terrible student, but being resilient and being creative um, and finding a way to make a story that where I wasn't at fault. So that was... um. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for sharing this anecdote. What happened to you and and your advice? I think these are nice words to to end this uh, webinar. I really enjoyed this webinar and the back to back uh, seminars by Stephen and Jeremy. I hope you liked it too. Thank you for your participation and and all your.